what was in your head even from then to now like how has your vision your experience evolved art is not the easy choice and and making art is hard right the artists they put they put themselves on the line to be criticized to be um vulnerable they're like their their whole lives are in the work and and i think that's it's so brave and i think for me it's always been about bringing art to life and i don't care how i do it i just want to do it when you believe in something it means you you don't give up don't be sensible listen to the little voice because that voice is right and that is your 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 superpower we're not equal i we are not equal we are different so let's celebrate our differences but we should be remunerated equally welcome to the podcast carry i'm very very excited to have you here today I am I'm honored honestly thank you so much um for inviting me and uh, as you may or may not know it's Thanksgiving in America and though I am based in the UK um I was busy this morning like stuffing the turkey and and throwing everything into the into the oven so it's awesome it's the perfect the turkey is in and now I get to sit and have a conversation with you so it's perfect amazing that's so nice thank you and I wish you a happy thanksgiving and everyone who's also listening to us right now you have a pretty big user user base in america right yeah yeah we have um even though i'm sitting in india um a lot of our um listeners a lot of our community members our distribution channels for our magazine our books everything is in europe and us awesome awesome so there will be some people who are also stuffing turkeys and <laughs> yes absolutely absolutely i'm very excited to actually hear from you first let's before we go you know into a lot of things that you do which is something that i really want to talk to you about you know you've worked in traditional arts you're a tv presenter you a curator writer many caps i get that look i get you i get you but um, i think the hardest decision some uh, question i get sometimes is when people ask who am i what do i do and i feel like which one should i pick and i feel like the look you just gave is something that you resonate with it i mean god nail on the head uh with that one right i i i sort of um you know i i started out in the art world uh almost 16 years ago 17 years ago and that like idea of a multi hyphenated person didn't exist but but it's it's who i've always been you know i um i love the idea of doing everything not just doing one thing and i think that's probably my like liberal arts background and upbringing um but so you know i am technically an art historian and sometimes at a cocktail party i'll say well hi i'm an art historian and then other times I say I'm an entrepreneur and I set up my own business 14 years ago and I exist kind of outside of the traditional space that galleries exist in. Um then other times I'm just like I I work in the art world. Uh you know, if I'm in a taxi I'll be like I sell art. Um and then I'll I'll occasionally say I do some art broadcasting. Um but I I do uh I do a lot of things and I wear a lot of hats and I have a small business and I think that's that's kind of the case with all of us, right? That um you know before before you hit record you were telling me your story and I, and i think it you know in the best possible way we kind of are all out here hustling and trying to make a space for ourselves that is the thing we want right i i was in, in the art world i was running galleries and um i was running a gallery in new york uh and the idea was very much that i was there to sell and that was it and i wasn't supposed to think about um the exhibition plan or install i wasn't really supposed to uh trouble myself with like anything that distracted me from selling and that it that just didn't work for me you know i i wanted to be in with the artists i wanted to be with the installers i wanted to um yeah i wanted to be like fully in it 
Sorry, my dog is barking at uh, something. No probably problem. A I love the bird. I love the sound of uh, dogs. I I love animals. I have two dogs of my own. Four oh, actually do you? now too. Yeah. So what kind always of dogs? welcomed. Um, so I have been rescuing dogs for a very long time now. So um, one is a mix of a lot of mixes. Uh, she's a Labrador with a mix of um, an Alsatian and an Indian. And the so she's called Dora. She's the naughty one. And then we have Kim, who's a Labrador again. She's she she was abandoned on the road, so we got her. You know, rescued her, and she's our little baby now. So that that's a that's a lab mix as well, and oh. also a girl. So oh, it sounds I like I love female yeah. dogs. <laughs> I said, you know, in the beginning of the podcast, we have a lot of in a lot in common. I think that's true. <laughs> I think that's true. Yeah. Okay. Tell me something. If you were, there's something I I recently heard, and I want to. I I keep asking this question to a lot of people now. You know, this is in the age that we are today. It's not this or that. This it is this and that. We no longer are into profiles and professions where you're either a historian or a curator or an artist or a business owner. It's artist and business owner historian and curator and writer and that and can go forever um if you were to be identified as like you know um a lot of times when people ask you what you do you know a long list of those names is not the easiest what do you think is your internally um and i also think a lot of people also address this identity with the money that is coming from the popularity but it's also confusing in our heads as well so what is that one identity you associate yourself the most today if i were to ask you that's so hard um that is so hard i think probably probably um I'm, there isn't a word for me. I mean, that's such a cop out. It's such a cop out. But I don't think there is, you know, I, I don't know. I'm not a traditional curator in the sense that, you know, I don't have a single collection that I'm looking after. I don't work at a museum. I don't have an institution. Um, I do shows. I do that. And um, I've done some extraordinarily exciting shows and I've and I have curated them and so yes I am a curator yes I am an art historian but I haven't written an art historical paper in 15 years 16 years that's the head talking it's the head talking that's the head talking but 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 I think that I think you know I could I could distill more easily like what's my what drives me and i can only distill that because because like you i think in the last couple of years i have been asking myself why like w- w- what drives me and what pushes me and that's a question i ask the artists that i work with all the time like w- why do you do what you do and what do you want from it um and i think for me it's always been about bringing art to life and i don't care how i do it i just want to do it you know, I want to get people in front of artworks and I want them to talk about it and I want it to be loud and I want people to go to museums and to say, I don't get it. Can someone like, you know, tell me or not even like, I don't get it and talk to the person next to you who might not be an expert, but who, who yeah, will say, have a conversation. Ooh. Exactly. Exactly. Like just talk. So if you can figure out a word <laughs> for that, like, what is that role? I'm going to think about this, <laughs> but well, oh, you know what? You need uh, you need the same word. I think you need the same word. There is a word that's you know I I so I I've had this for so long. I would do so many things, and then at the end of the day, I really resonate with what you said because so a lot of times when I write now I like write a creator because for me, for all I care is I'm a compulsive creator. Like for me. I'm a person who, like, even if I'm I'm sleeping or before bed or something, if there's an idea, I literally, like, I am a person who 
season visuals um i'm extremely excited by ideas of creating something if you tell me we have a discussion and you're like okay you know uh, how we could do this and i'm like now i start visualizing it and i have this compulsive desire to create i don't care if one day i'm creating a painting a business um an exhibit a book uh i don't know a house a furniture um and food for that matter i think for me though i know what i feel like the flow state when i'm creating something and i think that drives me that drives me so much because there's there's no other way i would do it well yeah i mean that that sounds very similar to my process um you know i've got about i looked yesterday it was like 625 notes on my phone which are just like i haven't dared to count that <laughs> that it says it on the side um oh, wow. and i was like i should go through some of these cuz they're they're rubbish or they're just older you know it's how i it's how i do instagram god god forbid that um anyone actually i have this amazing woman who who works with clients and i um on on social media and she would she would kill me if she, if i admitted this but i do all my social media in notes like and i and then i edit them in there and then i chuck them up i'm so ad hoc about it and i'm so disorganized and and she is amazing because Britney always has the content calendars and stuff in spreadsheets and you know and then you can go back and you can repost the stuff but mine is totally disorganized but I do everything in notes and I'll you know if I see something or I read something or I um you know it's it all goes into notes to then later digest to later think about so there's another great advice I received here was which I did try to follow not as much which was um I started writing um these things into um a word doc and somebody advised me that you know if you start because i love writing somebody um said that if you start writing in a document one place in whatever if you're writing for arts to hearts if you're writing for your art whatever and if you keep on writing page on page one day it could become a great book i was like that's a great idea the only block is that i'm not going to be as organized as this yet in my life <laughs> so i would do that i still have a doc when i I remember that I often go there and write and it it has a lot of pages now and I really like that idea because it did really make sense because oh wow yeah and in a, in a way I'm writing a book which is literally documenting that process and my thoughts and I can look back and see okay how I'm evolving into it smart I'm doing a a series I'm about to in in March of next year I'll be launching a a new um initiative uh as part of my business but um and for that it's called scene s e e n um and is that one you were recording for yes yeah 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 um oh, well. and uh so for that we're do i'm doing an art world 101 like what is a curator what is a what's the primary market versus the secondary market and for that one the art world 101s they are all in one file but again it's because i can just go into google docs and like quickly even on my phone like oh ooh, actually we should talk about how do you auction off a work um so so that's genius though i might just do that for all of you know. yeah and you know in the world that we live in today i feel like as creative people there's so much creation we're already doing subconsciously we are we're almost on a wheel of that you know creating a post then writing a caption editing a reel writing a script um sending a letter and you know all of that if we really did put it into one place we all have our own books don't we so many books actually it's i mean and also that is a lifelong goal of mine i i always when i was a kid i wanted to be a writer um and i still in the back of my head i love the idea that i would have a book out there in the world um but who has the time so maybe this is how we get the time no we this is how it yes this is how we do it i'm sure we will okay let's start now that you've spoken about you wanted to be what did you really want to be can we talk a little bit about your early years um i know you've born and brought up in the uk you're currently living there but you also just mentioned you're celebrating thanksgiving Can you talk a little bit about your cultural references how you grew up your interest in the arts your exposure what brought you here You know what thank you so much for asking me that question um often people don't and uh well i think everyone always assumes i'm just american um and 
And I'm not, right? I was born in the UK. I moved to the States when I was five with my mom and my stepdad. My father was still here um, in the UK. And I, I, you know, my whole life, I have straddled both these cultures. And, and my accent as a result is a bit confused. Um, if I'm yelling, if I'm yelling at my children, I'm like Mary Poppins. I'm so British. Uh, but you know, if I'm with my friends, I'm this sort of loud American. Um, I've almost done 50, 50 in terms of time in the U S and the UK. Uh, and I honestly, I, I don't, I don't feel like I really belong in either place entirely. Yeah. So I love, I mean, I love them both and there are bits of both cultures that, um, I adore, but, but when I meet, British people for the first time, they're like, oh, you're American. I'm like, no, no, I'm English. I'm English American. And then when I'm in America, they're like, oh, you're English. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm English American. So, so, but I think that that's played a really interesting role in, um, in kind of how I see art because I'm, I'm, I, or no matter what, I'm asking questions right? Because I'm interested in people and I'm interested in cultures and I'm interested in our experience of the world. And so I think like my, my sort of, uh, MO walking around is like, Oh, Hey, who are you? What are you trying to do? Where are you from? Because I'm like, I'm this investigating. Kind of weird... Yeah, exactly. Um, so, I mean, the, the potted history is, as I said, I always wanted to be a writer. I went to, um, an amazing liberal arts school in Pennsylvania, teeny tiny called Dickinson college. And there I majored in English um, and I minored in fine art, but I ended up with enough credits with enough credits to actually have double majored. I didn't double major because I was too busy uh, doing art history, uh, fine art and English. And I, I was just so happy. And right out of uni, um, I got a job with Condé Nast in New York. And I kind of thought, I was like, I've done it. I'm gonna be a writer. Uh, it's great. And then Condé Nast was not, um, was not perfect. It was, it was very Heard corporate. Heard that a lot, and, of, a lot of time, actually, from a lot of people yeah. now. Yeah. It's, it's, listen, it's an amazing place. The building was super cool. It was four times square. I was, a, I was a baby. Um, we got to do so much and I was looking after the online part of it. This is 2001. So online was kind of in its infancy. Um, and, uh, and, and, but for a number of reasons, I wasn't, it, it wasn't right for me. Um, and so one of the benefits, and it was a benefit of, uh, working there was that they gave you, you had membership to every single major museum in the, in New York. So Whitney, MoMA, um, you know, Guggenheim, I, we had full membership and you could go, there and those places became like my church. So post September 11th, which was a really, really sad time and an impossible time for me just to compute what had happened. I was going to museums all the time. Um, and this sounds like a movie, but I was sat in a, the Gerhard Richter show. He had a retrospective. I had never heard of him. Um, and it was a retrospective. I think at MoMA, I should look this up. And a security guard was like, you have been here 10 times, girl. What are you doing here? And she was this like amazing New Yorker. She was just like, what are you doing, girl? And I was like, I, oh, I just, I love the work. And I'm like broke and I have nowhere else to go. Um, <laughs> and I have a free pass. Been, <laughs> exactly. Free pass. Hello. Uh, and she was like, she was like, oh, you, you're not an artist. I said, no, 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 I'm not an artist. She's like, you work in the art world. No, I don't work in the art world. I just love the work. And we had this like lovely conversation. I left there and a couple of weeks later, I thought, you know what? I gotta, I gotta do this as a job. <laughs> so applied to grad school. Um, I only applied to, well, I applied to grad school at New York, London, and then uh, California and, Se and Seattle, Washington. Um, I mean, so random. The, the Seattle, Washington one, but there was a professor there who I had read something she had written and her name was Patricia Failing, and I loved it. And I was like, I'd never been there. I was like, I'm gonna apply there. Uh, I didn't get into NYU. I didn't get into the court hold here. I was heartbroken. Um, 
and I got into the University of Washington and they gave me a little bit of money. And I was like, I'm going to go there, having never been there. <laughs> <laughs> so got there and it was amazing. It was this, the program was epic, um, but the city was even better. So the the art scene there, it's small but mighty. And that's the only way to describe it. You have these incredible collectors and collections um, and you have these creative people who are willing to kind of do anything and everything. So people like Greg Lundgren, who he had an art bar, he did a 24 hour play. Um, and in one of his bars, he had this vending machine, like a jukebox almost that you'd put money in and then you'd get a limited edition, not a limited, an original painting by one of the Seattle artists. So like all this weird, it was so cool. So cool. All this weird creative stuff. Um, it really must have opened you as like a young, really like, because I think in those years we are like, it's like just absorbing. It really opens up your mind. Even if you like close on later, it's like you still know what, what's still out there. You're so right. And that was the thing is that, you know, you, know, you had collectors who, um, Bill and Ruth True, they, they built a, a like warehouse space that was part public, part private and had all their video works because they had the, one of the biggest video collections um, at the time. I mean, it, and, and so I interned for them and then they put me forward to run a nonprofit that was attached to a different university in Seattle. And then someone uh, said, oh no, I think they said, the Trues also said, you need to meet James Harris who had this gallery. And so I went and worked for him and you could just do all this, you could do stuff, right? And then I started writing for the newspaper um, and it just felt like nothing was impossible. Like anything, anything was possible. Um, and and Jim, James Harris, Jim was, was amazing. You know, taught me how to build a crate, taught me how to paint a wall, taught me how to talk to clients. Uh, and and he, he just, he was the most supportive, incredible boss. Um, and, and then, so I was with him for like three years and then, or maybe two years. Um, and then I, uh, oh God, the sun's come out. I'm going to be blind for a minute. Oh, it's going to go away again. It's England. You have the golden light. The golden light. It's coming yes. in. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And then I was, I was in New York for, I think it was Armory. Um, and okay. My brother, uh, he was working, he does non-traditional marketing. He still does non-traditional marketing. He's older than me. Wow. Um, and he, and I say he's older than me because he's always more organized. And um, <laughs> and this was the first instance where he wasn't or something had happened and someone couldn't work the door for him on an event. And I was in town uh, for the Armory Art Fair. And he said to me, hey, do you want to work the door? door for me, I'll give you another 200 bucks or something. And as you know, the art world <laughs> yeah. does not pay yes. at the bottom. <laughs> uh, so I was like, perfect. Give me the extra $200. And I was yeah. sat at the door and this group of really cool looking people came up um, and their names weren't on the list okay. for the thing. Uh, and, and one of them said something like, well, hey, I'm an artist. And I was like, well, hey, I'm an art history graduate student. What do you do? <laughs> right? We just had this ridiculous exchange. And that person turned out to be um, Rashid Johnson, who oh, is now wow. a household name. I went back, looked him up. Um, he had given me, I think, his email. I sent wow. him an email say saying, I mean, we were babies, right? Like, uh, I think I sent an email. How long ago was this? 2006. I mean, so long ago, 2006, 2007, something like that. I sent him an email saying, I think your work's really cool. He had just finished grad school. Um, and I was like, I'd love to do a show here. He was like, hey, yeah, up for it. Um, I then said to my, said to Jim, I was like, this guy's really cool. We should do this. He shrugged his shoulders and was like, that'll be the first show you do. Go for it. Um, and so... 
I curated my first ever exhibition with with Rashid. Uh, it, and and then and then he got picked up by a New York gallery who he suggested um, that I should go to New York and run. Um, and so I moved, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Like six months after that. So that's the, that's the quick history before we get into like, okay, when did, when did I start on my own? I think art world and I might be wrong. I, I might be missing a lot of those details, but I typically, you know, art world, Hollywood, Bollywood and India, like these are some kind of professions that people feel like, you know, there's a doctor, engineer, all of these, you know, there's academics. This is still a set pattern. They're not as untraditional. Um, they are considered to be a lot more safe, uh, academically, you know, more prestigious and well-paying, all of it. Versus creative jobs and creative jobs like in the art world. They're not math jobs. They're not as common. Uh, not everybody has an artist at home, a curator at home, or, you know, a collector or like, you know, a museum. But, you know, these are not as rare, at least from where I come. So it's not, it's, and then there's, there's a huge difference in the sense of, I think, lifestyle. Um, for example, from where I came, I never went to, so in India, there's not a, there's no museum culture as such. It's, it's gotten better. Like I said, in the beginning also, India is a very craft driven country. So um, even if you walk today, you'll see like, you'll see so much art and craft on the roads itself even without going to a museum. Um, we have um, we have had some some incredible um, ca- you know ways of how people engage, but going to museums and galleries has never been that. Um, I never went to one till I actually went to Louvre. That was my first ever museum visit. Then I started then when I got, got into the arts here, of course. So it always felt like it was an unapproachable dream or a place where, you know, it was only for the rich or uh, this was, you know, did you ever feel that before you got into it? I, it's a great, it's a great question. Uh, And, you know, as a, as a young girl, my parents definitely exposed me to museums in a way that obviously you're, you're saying you, you didn't, um, and, you know, famously, my father hates it when I tell the story, but um, when, I, when I came over to the UK, he had a client who was, and he was a financial advisor, but he had a client who lived or had an office on the same square as the Wallace Collection, um, which is an incredible building. And anyone that's in London should go there. It's totally underrated. And, and, um, people forget that it's there and it's gorgeous. It's just gorgeous. Um, you know, they have a, the Fragonard famous swing painting. Um, they've got like knights in shining armor, but anyway, they, uh, my dad, my dad would regularly, and I don't know how old we were, but we were young enough we were young enough that I can remember thinking, this is awesome. He would take us there and leave us. He'd go to his meeting and my elder brother and I would be left in the museum. And I don't know if he like talked to the security guards. This is the eighties. So like anything, you know, it didn't matter. And it was definitely like, don't leave the museum, just stay here. But it's a little safer. I don't know how many parents would be, would you be as a parent today willing to do that? Hell no. <laughs> I mean, I one, I'd be worried that the children would break something. <laughs> and now that you know the cost of it, and what would that bring on you? Exactly, exactly. Like, there's no way. Uh, there's no way. So, I think. But yeah, so he he did that, um, and I would just hang out there. And in in boredom, I can remember kind of making up stories about the works in the collection. I can remember starting to sketch the stuff. I mean, I, I, I loved it. And then obviously being so close to New York growing up, I, we lived sort of 40 minutes outside of the city. Um, whenever my mom could, she'd drag us to museums. And then my godfather, who was really present in my life, he, he loves the arts. Um, but you know, it wasn't a collector. There were no curators, um, my mom's a psychoanalyst. My, my dad was a financial advisor. My stepfather's an accountant. You know, I was not, yeah, we were, I was not in the art world at all, but 
but I was by virtue of them taking me to things. Uh, and, and listen, the, the, the thing I always think now or looking back, it's like, if I knew, if I knew one that it would be quite so difficult as in, you know, I've seen my friends who've had, who have much more traditional jobs and their careers have just done that. Um, I wonder if I'd do it again, you know, or or if I'd just be like, okay, just do the things you got to do to get the museum job to like be at the tippy top and then. Yeah. So I've not, I hadn't seen like, you know, business as women. There were no business women in the sense. And if women at all had careers, it was like maybe, you know, get a job, do a job, then get married. I think that's, that's the trajectory that I'd seen for a really long time. But um, it, I think... Um, People say that if you went to do out on your own, there's so much more freedom, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which is true. What people often don't tell you is you have the freedom to decide what you do when, but you are doing it all the time. Uh, you do not have a nine to five. You have a 24 seven job. Uh, the stability is on a stake. There's like also like, you know, like you just said. A lot, a lot of time people also say that you should do a business or a job, something that you really enjoy. The flip side to that is also sometimes when you make something that you do for fun a job, sometimes the fun also goes away. And you have, it's such a tricky balance to always make sure that, you know, how have you dealt with it? You know, from switching from, you know, being in the traditional world also, and now being in this new age world, I'd say right now, for... Uh, sake of a better word. I feel that. I feel it so, uh, I mean, I feel what you said so deeply, this like the, the pros and cons of doing the thing that you love, right? The thing I, I, you know, I don't like inexplicably, I am drawn to art <laughs> and, and so as a result, right, when most people get to just finish their day, they're done. It doesn't ever end for me. And that's not to say it's because I don't have like a work life balance. I, I, I probably don't because like work is my life, right? My, my life is, is work because I've, I've picked the thing I love. And my husband, you know, my husband and I talk about this a lot and he's like, but it, it, I, it's so wonderful that you get, you get to do the thing that, that you love more than anything. And I'm like, it, it is. It's not as, as easy as that. No, it's really, it's not. And he, listen, he, of all people, he, he gets it. But as you said, it's like, you know, you go to bed or you're going to bed and you think, oh, wait, 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 wait. I, I need to talk to Bindi about the book because I've just had this massive idea. And so, you know, you pick up your phone and you get on and, and yeah, it just, it doesn't, it doesn't ever end. Um, it doesn't ever, yeah, it doesn't ever end. But, but I think as I'm getting older, as I'm getting older, um, I, I don't know that I'm getting better at it. Um, but actually I'm getting better at leaning into the things that I love more, if that makes sense. So because this is our lives and this is the thing that we've chosen and we're, we're doing the things that we love, I think it's really important to then say, okay, well, what are the things I'm good at? And what are the things I love? And what are the things I'm bad at? And that I don't love about this job, and can I go and find people who are better at it than me? Than me, I definitely would agree on this because I definitely feel it has something to do with age. Um, I've I've started businesses um, and been a creative for over a decade now, and I've seen this in my own self in the sense of um, I know that I had this attitude in the beginning, which was I wanted to do it all by myself. And now I've come to a point where, okay, I know this is really, I only, I only have this much of bandwidth. I would have really loved to do more. I really don't want to. I, I choose this intentionally now. And knowing that um, I'm, there's far someone better than I am who'd be really able to do this job better than I would be. And I think there's also a sense of urgency that I, that I wouldn't say has completely gone. But uh, I think in the age and time that we are, specifically for artists, I think it's become a very crucial time. I remember I had a, 
I really had this conversation with myself and I thankfully I had this experience. Um, there was a point where I was so busy with so many things and um, I intentionally chose my art not to be my source of, um, you know, income. So I didn't want to push, put that much pressure on my creativity to bring money. And at one point, I started to think that, am I really like, you know, you, you start to question yourself. Specifically, I think as people who are, you know, podcasters who have a habit of questions, let's say. Um, and I started to question myself, like, you know, why am I really doing this? Because, I don't know, I've done it for so long or I'm, I mean, I'm trying to prove something or I'm buying into an idea or something like that. And I kept on questioning, questioning and I quickly realized that for me, art was just something that I really had to do. Like I would become breathless or I, if I didn't create something and there's still days when if I don't go in the studio, if I'm not doing something, it's, it's like the base of anything I do. I don't care if I'm doing it for selling, for myself, in my studio. I no longer, like, you know, I said in the beginning when we were speaking, like a lot of times identity is associated with how we're making our monies from. But often our real identity is not where the money is coming from. The real identity is really what pulls us, you know, what grounds us. If I'm not in the studio, I know I'm, ne I'm nowhere. I know I'm, if I'm not being an artist, I cannot be any of other things because everything stems from there. So when you also, you know, in your own uh, bio, I also read, like, you know, you said you started a business, which was a, an art gallery, a consultancy and a supporting a unit for artists all at once. And this is something that I'm sure when you were starting was not as common, like, you know, um, it, it was either you help artists, you help collectors, you help a gallery. It was the, either or, or. And I think just someone, I think, like you said, the core was you being in the arts and you figured that there was some way you could really bring these together. Can you talk a little bit about that and what was in your head even from then to now? Like how has your vision, your experience evolved? I think, I mean, I, lo I love hearing the thing, the thing that we forget about artists. And I love that you just said this is that art is not the easy choice and, and making art is hard right? Artists, they put, they put themselves on the line to be criticized, to be um, vulnerable. They're like, they're, their whole lives are in the work. And, and I think that's, it's so brave. And we forget people are like, oh, being an artist is so easy. Like sit around, you paint and you're like, no, dude, it, it not isn't. Today it's not today anymore. No. And, but was it ever? No. I mean, Van Gogh sold one painting in his lifetime. Sure. We all know his name now, but like it has never been, it's, it's never the easy choice. And I think most but you know artists, what? that is also, you know, how, um, how juxtaposition is in it in this old sentence as well. Like, you know, we are calling someone who's sold one work so far, the father of the century, like he's the art artist of the century. And if I were to tell you today, the first question, if someone comes in as an artist and somebody will tell you, oh, I'm an artist. Oh, so where do you show your work? Oh, do you have a gallery? How much work have you sold? Um, do you, you know, it's, it's such a paradox. Like how are identities like, you know, if you say you're a writer, somebody would ask you, I remember someone telling me this also. So strange. Uh, she said, like, you know, I am an author. And somebody asked her first time, oh, which which publication are you associated? Who published your work? And she said, I self-published. So, you know, how how paradoxical it is for someone, how we associate identities today versus... No, but but this is a, this is a debate I've been having for a while with anyone that will talk to me about it. It's like, you know, there is a name for 1% of of the artists in the world as in people we call artists are the people that are represented by galleries that's it right then there's everybody else who's you know uh, who may be selling work on etsy who may be a graphic designer who may be painting every day or drawing every day but they don't have representation and they're not selling so we slightly need to to uh define right what 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 is an artist um but uh to get back to your point about my business god i mean i never had a plan i would love to say that like 
I knew what I was doing. I never had a plan. Um, Nicole Clagsburn. So I worked for her for 2000 in 2008 and 2009. I got to her in May of 2008 and obviously New York fell apart again. Um, so, I mean, if I ever say I'm moving to New York, I always say this to people like, d just don't like short the market or something because every time I've moved there as a grown up, it's, it's been a disaster for the whole city. Um, but so she, and then she laid me off, uh, because the world was falling apart again. I was completely devastated, um, because my whole identity was, was working and, and being like, I had never failed at something and I felt like I failed. I mean, I really felt like I failed and everyone kept saying to me, you haven't failed. Like this is layoffs. Like this is, we're on the worst recession ever, da, 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 da. but I couldn't see it that way. Um, and then I thought, okay, well, how am I going to, I mean, after like I'm, a lot of tears and a lot of bottles of wine uh, and a few weeks of like, what am I going to do and how am I going to pay the bills? Um, I thought, you know, maybe, well, I applied for some jobs. None of them worked out. And then I was like, you know what? I got to do this myself. I don't have a mortgage. I don't have any kids. I, I'm almost 30. I was 28 at the time, 29, 28, 29, somewhere in there. Um, I'm just going to set up on my own and I'll do some like pop-ups. I'm going to get like a bit of Seattle back in me and I'll, I'll just do stuff. Um, and I think my parents, all of them were like, what? <laughs> this is why we told you don't go to grad school for art history. Like, what are you going to do with that degree? And, and I had, I had student debt at that point. Um, you, you know, I, it, it was, it was scary, but I was like, there's gotta be a way to help artists outside of the gallery system. And I'll just do pop-ups because pop-ups were starting. It wasn't, there wasn't really a word for it yet. You, it, they were like temporary exhibitions. Um, and I just, like luck, right? I had a client in Seattle who who asked me to help them a bit on some stuff. So that was a gallery that was like, hey, write our press releases and help us with client outreach. And, and I was like, from New York? And they were like, yeah. So I did that with them and I went to a few fairs with them. And then I met um, a guy called Jimmy Moffitt, who is amazing. And he ran Art and Commerce, which um, that was, he set that up in the, in the seventies, seventies, eighties. And that he's an agency for, for fashion photographers. Uh, and he represented everyone from like Steven Meisel to Annie Leibovitz. And he said, Hey, I've got this artist, um, in London called Nick Knight. And I was like, I know Nick Knight. He did the massive attack album cover and the Bjork album cover. And Jimmy was like, okay, yep, he did. Great. Um, he, Nick is, is trying to uh, run a gallery alongside his studio and maybe you could go and sort that out. So I agreed to like a six month contract. They obviously also knew I had a British passport. So they were like, perfect, go, go do that. Come for six, yeah. Uh -huh. So I came for six months at the time I was also dating my now husband. Um, and so I was like, perfect, I'll, I'll like figure out the boy because there's no way I'm moving just for the boy. And I've got a six month retainer. And, and then I was like, huh, I actually have a business now. And so that's, that's honestly, there was no plan. And that's how it's happened, right? So then I started helping artists. So I was embedded in Nick's studio and I had a few other can artists you, that I was Can you like, elaborate how, um, how does that really, can you give us a behind the scenes and how you do it in real life? How do you really like, what kind of artists are you helping? Um, how are you helping? I know you say you have frank partnerships, you're helping artists and collectors. Can we speak so that really people from all, anyone who's a beginner artist, who is a mid career, top of the career, anybody, like if they want to understand if they are the right fit, how can they make the most of it? Uh, just for everybody's knowledge. Yeah. Uh, so with artists, I, I, I mean, hilarious given I've just said, I don't do I don't have a plan or I didn't have a plan. I now have a plan. Um, uh, I make them sit down and tell me what they, what they want, like, where do they want to get to? And, um, how do they like, what's the goal with the work? So do you want to be in a museum? Do you want to 
have a book? Do you want to, what do you want to do? And, um, and, and then I work backwards. So if an artist says to me, I want an, I want a retrospective in the VNA, I say, okay, it's pretty ambitious. That's going to take 10 years, probably, unless you're super established. And even in 10 years, it might not happen, but let's, let's like plot it. How would we get there? How, what do we need to do? Um, and, and then I like action those things. So if, if it's, um, I mean, I can give you, it, it's probably better if I give you an actual real world example. And so also Binti tell Bork, me what kind of artist uh, specifically, because um, I think in today's age, artists are really looking, I think we've become smarter. I think artists have really become smarter. Um, a lot of artists have come to the point that they've understood that their role as artists are just not making work, but also being strategic, also finding good collaboration partnerships with people who really can help them because we cannot do all by ourselves. So let's say what is an ideal kind of artist that you'd work with or someone who, if they wanted to check if they fit the bill or yes. a, any, okay. any level, right. Okay. Um, any level artist, uh, just someone who's, who's willing to, do the work right yeah. there is no there is no formula here there is no right answer it's the art world's the wild wild west yeah it's the creative world i mean you create what you want exactly and and you have to be willing to like take risks and you have to be willing for it to not work for a while you have to be willing for um it to yeah, to be really successful at some point. So I think flexibility, it doesn't matter where you are, at what stage in your career. Um, what I'm most interested in is like projects. So if you've got an amazing project that I can see a beginning, middle and end, I'm excited to work with you. And that's, I was going to give you, I'm going to actually reach a prop, even though I didn't mean for it to be there, but it's there. So like Bindi, um, she is an incredible young artist who during lockdown, she sent me a PDF. I had worked with her before. I had, I had curated her into a show in 2019, 18, 18, maybe. Um, and during lockdown, she sent me a PDF with uh, a selection of these works in it. And it was like a lifeline. I, you know, it was one of those days where like the planes had stopped flying overhead. The kids were driving me crazy. I was trying to homeschool and I was like, the, right? Oh, the world is over. What are we doing? And this, this PDF lands and her, her whole thing was, was using this body of work to try and understand COVID. So she was taking words from headlines or tweets now X. Um, and, and she was then combining them with found images from archives that she had bought. And then she was placing these beautiful, um, little interrogations or em embroidery over the images that made your eye fall around. Anyway, I was like, Oh, everything's going to be okay. Bindi, let's do a zoom or a live Instagram live or something. Let's just talk about this work and let's just, and she, she was like, okay, great. Let's do that. So we did that. Then we started selling a few pieces and like permanent collections got excited about it too. It just struck a chord. Right. And so it was this beautiful thing. And from there, right, we've sold work, we've shown work, we've, um, I mean, we, uh, we've done talks together. And then this, this book happened. So Perimeter Editions, which I don't know how well you can see that, but it's like a little brick, right? It like hits you over the head. Um, Perimeter Editions, who are this fantastic team in Australia, husband and wife, they got in touch and said, we love the series, could it be a book? And the series went on and on and on. So it doesn't just chart COVID. It was for like the two years that we were properly dealing with COVID, which it was two years. But so this thing charts COVID. It charts George Floyd being murdered. It charts Black Lives Matter rising up. It charts all of our politicians making a, a mess. It, it like, it's this portrait of a moment. And you go through it and it doesn't matter. I mean, okay, I just opened page 342 
And the text in the book is isolated from the artwork. In the artwork, the text is underneath. And it's like, this page is, we are more than just bodies, okay? The next one is, we've turned a corner and the escape route is in sight. Uh, and then, oh man, weaponized stillness is an undervalued superpower. Like this, this thing, it's still, it still has all the gravity that it had. When you saw it for the first time. Right? Um, yeah. And it's just remarkable. And like, those are the images that she chose to go with it. But, but that is a project that like, perfect, perfect. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and we did it. For we, you. Yeah. And we got it out in the world. So yeah. So, so that's a, that's a like classic. That's how I work with, with artists. Amazing. It's so exciting. Well, thank you. It's fun. It's fun. Hard, hard, but fun. Sometimes uh, when you're having fun, even if it's hard, um, you get through it. That's, I think that's what is, I think that's the cherry on the cake when you do something that you love. Otherwise it's just hard. <laughs> right. Otherwise it's just hard. But I think that's also something to do with when you believe in something. Yeah. You know, I, I believe in Bindi. I believe yeah. in that work. And so, and so it doesn't like, it doesn't matter how much time, how many times we're told no. And we're, we, you know, there have, there have been some moments where you're like, God, am I, you know, we haven't sold anything for three weeks or, or three months, you know, are we okay? Is this okay? Um, and then all of a sudden you're like, Ooh, there are 12 editions that are almost sold out. How did that happen? Um, so, but I think when you believe in it, it, it means you, you don't give up. Yeah, I agree with that. You just keep going. You just figure it out. You keep figuring it out yeah. until you figure it, it out. A friend of mine made the analogy the other day um, about this new business or this new arm of my business that um, we're starting. And, uh, and he was saying, he's like, it's a bit like, um, it's a bit like a, a um, video game. So you, you just have to, you just have to stay alive and make it to the next level. And by staying alive, you can fail, right? Because in a video game, and, and just imagine, he's like, just imagine you have unlimited lives, right? You can try and make the jump and you fall down the hole and you can try and make the jump and you can fall down the hole. You just got to make it to the next level. Like just make it to the next level. And it's a weird analogy. One, because I don't really play video games. The kids do on occasion. Um, but like, but I loved that. I loved the like, no, 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 you can't fall down the hole and fail. And then you can get back up and you can try it again. It just, it felt like a lovely analogy. No, I think it's really nice. Yes. And it's, I think, I think as creative people, we also find a lot of inspiration from these analogies because it's, it does, like, it's great to be practical, but sometimes I think like these ideas really give us hope. Uh, I think we've all hit the ground. We've hit bottom specifically in the last three years. I'm sure we've all had some really terrible things to face, be it a financial uh, loss of loved ones or something. And I think in those days, specifically in my own experience, I feel like when you really look at these things and you figure out, okay, one more time, I think I keep telling myself whenever I hit the ground, I'm like, I did it before one more time. And there's like, you know, you keep telling yourself another time, just one more life. Like, you know, while playing the video game, you're like, just one more life. And you just keep getting that. Okay, there's another thing I wanted to talk to you about, something that I deeply am very, very passionate about. And I know you've spoken a lot about, which is specifically, of course, women in the art world, um, but also generally women. I think for me, um, women came first, art world came second. I was, like I told you, I grew up in a very patriarchal setup. Um, I just, even it wasn't, like a traditional patriarchy, I think it is so deeply ingrained into our system, in our subconscious, in our, in our cultures, in our gender roles, that I absolutely growing up, I always, always retaliated and hated the way women were being treated, specifically around me, um, how our identities 
even today as modern women i think that is one of the biggest themes for me as a woman uh, as an artist like you know how my work is on modern maharani and maharani is like a keyword for a queen you know and i keep saying this why you know so when in india so if a woman is like you know if there's somebody uh, we have a niece so i don't have children i'm not married but i stay with my family and my brother has um a boy and a son and i'm very close to my niece and i keep telling her like you know if if she's doing oh don't be a maharani or don't be this and that's how we also grew up like if a woman is expecting too much being too much being good or bad like you know how we're always in put in a spot and um women in the art world is we all know can you talk about how how has this does this have any personal root to it your own experience as a woman and how is it extending into your professional life i think i've said this sentence about 20 times this podcast but I, again like you um i mean we really are very similar this is something i i since since i recognized that i was a a girl i was like that's not fair don't treat me like that um and and i have rallied against it <laughs> since i was a teenager really um and then and then it was definitely brought out at university so i studied a, a this um, this poet very little known still called mina loy and she was part of that set of um like the, the james joyce and gertrude stein and she was she was part of those women who were really strong and were fighting for their voices um but then she she walked into the ocean and she like gave up and it was that like this image of that actually the patriarchy was just too hard for her and all her work her her most famous collection of of poems is called the lost lunar bedecker which is a, a guide book um and it just felt like her entire life was also rallying against the patriarchy and the way that she as a woman was treated um and it hit hard right and then i got to to grad school and i i saw this this work by an artist that was really tied up in third wave feminism and at that point third wave feminism was was where we were and it was all about like being awful to women again right you were kind of poking fun at at women who were too complicit um and that felt really wrong to me so i like picked apart this artwork because the artwork was absolutely doing that and i wrote a paper and i took it to uc berkeley and i was out on the like this is not fair um and so it's yeah it's it's come with me it's come with me and and as i've gotten older those i guess it feels more important than ever and um you know i have always worked with women i've always worked with women of of color i've always worked with people of all shapes and sizes ethnicity sexual preferences this is not a thing that needed to be named and if you look through my career you can you you can see that right yeah. there it's not um, something that you no and i just i don't i i don't get it i don't get why still you know yesterday yesterday was um I can't remember what it's called equal pay day where so everyone in the UK uh who is a woman has now stopped earning from now until the end of the year women aren't making any money because of the wow. discrepancy oh my god mm -hmm, because of the discrepancy between what women are paid versus what men are paid so that is like we're a third down or something like that you can look up the statistics but it was yesterday and you think okay and then you go back to in 1985 the gorilla girls made that piece with the dollar Right, the dollar sign they made that poster and the dollar sign is cut into a third and it says uh women make less than a third what men do and then it says like female artists make and i can't remember i'm terrible with numbers uh i can't remember what the percentage is but um it says how much female artists make less than men and you're like that's 1985 1985 we are in 2020 three people like God. how are we still almost four. almost four how are we still having this conversation yeah. why are we not i get it look and this is controversial and maybe people will come after me we're not equal i we are not equal we are different 
So let's celebrate our differences, but we should be remunerated equally. It's that simple, right? If, if I am as good at what I do as my male counterpart, pay me the same. And if you're telling me that Georgia O'Keeffe is not as good <laughs> as her male counterpart, who I can't think of, you know, who, who is it? Um, who would her painting male counterpart? I can't think of anyone who would be her painting male counterpart because no one does flowers, but you know what I mean? Like one of her contemporaries, you cannot tell me that her work has less value, but it does. Honestly, I feel like if we are really talking about disparity, women should be paid more because I feel like the roadblocks women have, men really don't have it. I mean, they don't have to bear children and that's just not... It's not that you and I decided. It really is what somebody decided. Um, and it's this could really go <laughs> south, but I really am going to say this. But I really do feel like, you know, um, so like I was having this conversation with my associate editor and all of our teams, they're mothers. They have children. One of them is expecting. And I understand completely how difficult it gets. Some days I feel like, and I told her, you know what? I really believe in what I really believe in this because someday I really want to have a child and I don't want to choose a career over a child or a child over a career. I truly believe that I want to do both. And that is only possible when a, I believe in it and B when, you know, people around you really make that a woman to really, but a man, when let's say a man wants to have a family, they don't have to decide. Um, let's say when I was young, um, I moved out from my parents' house while I was 18, that's not as easy and as common um, in our culture in the beginning. And it's, and there's so many things. I and my brother grew equally, like we're of the same age. We both had a huge disparity in all parts. Like, and for, for my parents, they always did it equally. But just growing up equally, I always, I always experienced that, you know, what is bare minimum and easy for a man versus a bare minimum and easy for a woman? Um, I didn't grow up learning a lot of skills because I couldn't really go as a woman. I I had curfews, times, which my my brother never did. He was skilled more than me because he really had those access. Um, versus, you know, like, you know, it's so, like I said, it's, it's just so, like, even when people are being fair, they can never be fair. And I keep on telling this to my my partner who's fairly like he's really like really open and you know he does not come. And I keep telling him and, and he keep he keeps saying, like, you know, he's not like he's not patriarchal misogynist. Like, and I'm saying, and I keep telling him, you know what? The most non-misogynist men in the world would still be a misogynist because that's how, like, even if you like it's a given. That's how you raised. That's how a man and a woman, they're always raised differently. And it's such a, it's such a deep rooted problem that I really don't know. Like we will still have to keep working on it, no matter how good we think we are. I think, well, first of all, you're absolutely right on every level. Um, I, I think, and this is so complicated and I will do a bad job of saying what I'm trying to say. I'm sure. Um, Biological determinism was thrown out in the 80s, right? But there's this amazing French theorist called Luce Irigaray. She has a book called That Sex Which Is Not One. And it's a seminal text for, for me. It's a seminal text for, for feminism. But she just talks about the, the, the fundamental difference between men and women um, does come down to our biology, right? So men are singular by virtue of they have a singular <laughs> phallus. And, and we are multiple because of of the way that we are gendered um and 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 here's the thing and here's the thing that nobody nobody talks about loudly enough yet and i it i can feel it it's happening but like as women right we go through puberty um men do that too so everyone gets a bit knocked around in that but then once a month, we experience this like massive hormonal thing that we have to deal with, which we do with grace and we're amazing, right? And we have to normalize it. Also in the modern times, um, it's, it's, 
even though our bodies are different and there's i think there's such a paradox in this as well where we're saying like oh you have to be this smart independent girl oh you just had your periods get up and you know go there and whatever and on the contrary there's also like this huge like your your body is experiencing something and we all have different ways of dealing with it and your body may require downtime or not i mean it's 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 never a gray black or white it's so gray and i you know i've now started to understand so well how my body works and this is i'm 44 years old seriously it took me this long it's insane but but that i you know i, I mark my calendar i know the seven days before i'm going to get my period do not like do not let self doubt guide you so i will not make big business decisions if i don't have to because because i get in those periods i get like i get anxious i doubt myself i and that's just hormones that's all it is is hormones but so i have to like cuss at myself a little bit and say okay look all the noises in your head they're legit listen to them but maybe don't act on them right now like just take a second so we have that to deal with all the time then you come to childbearing years and the seismic shift that goes on inside your brain and your body when you have these humans it's our society underestimates how big that is it's ginormous and so this fight between between work and kids and who you are as a person like that all happens and that's monumental and then guess what if you're me you have your kids you get them to a stage where you know mine are 10 and 6 and we're like we're cruising but i'm going to hit menopause any second and that's this seismic thing right i mean not any seconds but in the next decade it's it's coming for me it's probably already happening um and at the same time my kids are going to be in the the middle of of their own puberty so like meanwhile my husband who is amazing and is completely um you know he is a feminist through and through and through and he supports me and backs me and i couldn't do any of this without him he's like we had kids i'm just going to go back to work <laughs> right like what and i start talking to him about menopause and he's like is that really a thing is that going to happen i'm like dude i could completely lose my mind it could be years where i am just a different person we're just going to have to ride this out and he's like seriously i'm like no 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 seriously i saw my mom deal with it and i i saw her i mean really there's so many things that a woman does in a in a lifetime that i feel like is so extraordinarily normalized that i mean sometimes it's just like how like how like i keep on telling this to my even my brother when we grew up same uh, and i love this quote like even though if you're born to the same parents at the same exact time you'll never have the same experience and me and my brother we were we literally were grew up together um and and i i always fail to understand that how did he not see those sides that i saw as a woman as a girl growing up and what it did to like you know how how my mom probably experienced it and how i empathize with her and how that has given me my life's purpose versus for him he truly really didn't come to knowing after like really he like before him also even having a child or like so it's it's so 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 different and it's like it's like i think sometimes men can never truly understand i also say this to my partner like you know you can never understand because you will never understand what it takes to be a woman and it's not i'm saying that this is better or that but i'm just saying there's so different experiences that i would truly never understand what it means to be a, a man i would i wouldn't know what it feels and a lot of time people ask us why like like you said if i see the trajectory of my life everything has always been so women focused um my mom passing away was like a hit on the nerve and it really did a lot more and it really it it really made my purpose even more stronger and people ask why our church is only a women's community why my work is so much like is is always about women why i'm always speaking about that and i say i don't know anything better this is one thing i know through and through i know i i feel it or probably i'm being and i do feel like artists feel things a lot more deeply than let's say 
other people, creative people maybe. Um, and I feel like this is one thing I know through and through. I can speak from my heart. I can share. I feel so in my bones that I don't know there's any. I can, if you ask me what it takes to be a lawyer and a man, I don't know. I don't have a clue. But if you ask me what it means to be a woman, I have a lot of opinions and they're really strong ones and I will fight for it. I Thank God for that, right? Is that it? it is, you know, it is up to us to change the game. And, you, you know, you're doing it for the art world that you want to see, but you're also doing it for a culture. But but you're doing it for a culture you want to see, right? And I'm I'm raising these two little men, right? They're men. <laughs> they will be men. And, um, and, and so I think, I think you have a I'm, greater responsibility. Well, that's what I mean is that like, right. I feel more responsible now. That's like, that's like, don't you dare you boys, don't you dare put me or any other woman in some sort of ghetto that I'm not allowed to use that word or silo or do not dismiss us. You cannot dismiss us. You have to accept like all the parts of what it is to be a woman, because we have accepted all the parts of what it is for you to be a man. And, and we let you do that. I love that. I keep saying the same to my sister. She also has to, like a son and I keep telling her, and it's, it's, it's so strange. Like she keeps saying, Oh, while raising a boy, she tells these experiences like, you know, Oh, he's doing this. He's... And I'm like, it's so strange for like, for me to even hear like how, men grow up boys have so many different things to deal while growing up like as boy puberty understanding the bodies and all of that and i'm like you have some like i think mothers of boys today have such an important role to play on what the next generation and the place for women will look like because i feel like the biggest bottleneck from the history has been women has n they never communicated enough at least that's what i believe husbands never knew enough fathers never knew enough Brothers never knew en enough, sons never knew enough. Those experiences were never shared enough for them to even understand. And I think if we change that narrative so much, I mean, you, all of those people who are raising boys could bring so much of difference. You're so right. I mean, we have all of our, you know, our, our periods we had in secret, our first kisses we had in secret. Uh, anything that had to do with our bodies, it was secret. Whereas, you know, my brother was running around naked my boys, they run around naked all the time and it's fine. Uh, and it's like, I never, I never had that. I never had that. Um, so yeah, so I'm out here banging the drum just like you are. Um, and, and you know, I, I don't know. I don't, we have a way to go, but, but conversations like this, Move the it was a nice turkey conversation. I'm sure it it turned out longer than we I you know we expected, but it was so nice. It was it didn't turn out really. I didn't expect. I thought it would be a more art centered, but I think we really hit it off. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I, I it's seldom. I sometimes get on these and I'm like answering the question, then waiting for the next question. This this felt like a true conversation. So I'm thank you for that. What a like privilege, really. Same here, same here, and I'm so I'm so grateful that you did open up. I think that's that's always that's always a pleasure. And I'm sure you understand that because it's like you have one of the most like it's like time quickly passes away, and you really feel like you've taken away more than you've given. I really did feel that way, so I'm taking a lot of it from this conversation. I'm, I am hopeful this isn't our, it's our first, but it's not our last. I'd like. I mean, hey, anytime. Um, and when I get seen up and running, I might have to get you over on on our channel so um we're not doing a, not doing a podcast um but there's other things so so i might have to drag you i'm seeing all your I, i'm seeing all your video recording i'm very excited what it turns out and i always love how like i love how it create i just i feel women are so creative and i think the way energy energy we do things with is like it's always so empowering so i'm really really cheering for you but here wait one second before i let you go Anyone who's listening, one piece of advice you'll give us, okay, specifically for women artists, that's who we are uh, listening most, mostly, but beyond that as well, if you'd like. And where can people find you, support you? How can they learn more from you and anyone who's interested? Where do you want to direct them? One piece of advice, 
Do not ignore the little voice, the little tiny voice inside you. And I think going back to what we were saying as women, we have quieted ourselves. Um, and so those voices are small, but they are actually supposed to be our big voices. Uh, and, and the thing that has always always made me tick. It was a little voice at first that I was like, Ooh, art. Ooh, I like art. I think I like art. And, and then I was like, no, 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 be sensible. Don't be sensible. Listen to the little voice because that voice is right. And that is your, your, your superpower. The thing that scares you, it is, it is going to be the thing that makes you. So listen to that, the teeny voice. Um, and where are you asked me? Where, where do you find me? So i um, on Instagram even though I said I'm not really a, a traditional curator, my hashtag is Carrie Scott Curates. Um, and then I have a website, Carrie Scott. Uh, I don't use Twitter all that much. I'm trying to use TikTok more, um, but I'm not very hard to find. So, and, and you know, I'm very open to, to conversations like these um, with anyone that wants to have it. So drop me a line. Perfect. I will make sure that everything that you've mentioned, the links, the artist, um, and all your uh, touch points. We'll make sure that uh, that's mentioned in the show notes. There will be more work from you, uh, your projects, and more details from this episode in the show notes. So everyone who joined us, make sure you do visit the website and you check out Carrie's work. Make sure you, if you did like this and what part you did really resonate. I think one big takeaway from this conversation would be how we can keep the conversation going because I think that's what really matters. Um, if you have an experience that you'd like to share, make sure you do share, send us a message, share a story, drop a line, tag us. And, you know, if you, if something did resonate, let us know. But let's keep the conversation going. I think that's, that's what, what really matters to all of us. Thank you.